Welcome, this is Dr. Fiala. This is a, a brief lecture on uh, writing a research proposal. I'll have several other uh, little lectures about each section of the proposal. So this is a pretty short overview of what you uh, can, can expect. Start off with just some basics. Uh, the first question being, uh, why do people write research proposals? A variety of reasons depending on the context. But generally, uh, you can break it down to three three main categories. One, to get approval for a project. And this is often often happens if you're writing a thesis or dissertation. Uh, you have a proposal meeting where you uh, have written a paper and then you give a presentation uh, about uh, a project that you would like to do. And before they let you do it, they have to uh, approve it. And they'll tell you everything that's wrong with it and you may have to fix it. Uh, yada, yada. Uh, you might also... Um, you have to do it for uh, an IRB, although usually IRBs don't want to read uh, long papers, so they just want, you know, are you going to do anything with people, are you going to hurt them? Um, so uh, usually a very abbreviated uh, proposal for those situations. Uh, but for theses and dissertations, uh, the papers can be quite, uh, quite long. Uh, the other big reason is uh, to get somebody to pay for your research, right? You're looking for funding. Um, so if you're doing grant applications, those look very much like research proposals. You're basically saying, hey, here's what I want to do, here's why I think it's an important question, why um, I should be able to do it, and here's how I would do it if you would give me the money to go uh, and do this. Uh, and then the, the third reason, uh, which occurs primarily in academia, uh, is people just want to refine uh, uh, their ideas or their methods. So they've got an idea for a study, uh, but um, they maybe have limited funds, limited um, resources, and so they want to make sure and you know get it right, uh, you know, straight out of the box, and not mess around with having to uh, do a study, realize it was you didn't quite get what you're looking for because you didn't ask the questions the right way and have to go try to do it again. So you propose it to some colleagues maybe uh, and get some feedback on uh, a better way to do it or a better way to conceptualize uh, what you're doing perhaps. Or even um, you might have people challenge your hypothesis and it may lead you to rethink uh, what you would expect uh, an outcome to be. Um, okay, so who's the audience proposal? Well, depends on the purpose uh, but generally it's some group or a uh, committee of people um, who are again making some decision or giving you uh, feedback uh, and for this class um, it's uh, I'm the audience and the reason to write the proposal is because uh, it's a lot of fun and you have to. Uh, how's it different from a research paper? Uh, a couple ways two primary ones one verb tense uh, in a research paper you've conducted the study, so you're primarily writing in past tense, like throughout the method section results. You know, participants did this. In proposal, you haven't done it, so don't write it in past tense. And you know how many times I say that, people will still write in proposal. Participants completed yada yada. And no, they didn't. This is a proposal paper, not a research paper. So pay attention to your verb tense, and I'll talk more about that when we talk about the, the method section, because that's usually where people trip up. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, you don't have any analyzed data, which significantly changes uh, your, you know, instead of a results section, you have a data analysis section, and your discussion section is also quite different uh, because you don't have any results to uh, discuss. Um, <coughs> okay, so the components of a research proposal, um, similar to a paper, an introduction section, uh, where you're presenting two main things. One is your research question. And related to that, you're having to justify the importance of your question. You know, so why should anybody care about the answer to some question you're, you're posing? Why is it important? And it could be kind of a very applied reasons. Like, well, if, to get the, if we got the answer to this question, we could really help people, or people are suffering, so we need to know. Or it could be, um, you know, I'm advancing the knowledge uh, of the human condition or of science in some other way that uh, hasn't been done before and it's 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 important and it's relevant it's not you know what what are people's favorite colors uh, of frisbees um, so the importance of your research question and then the other thing you're going to address in the introduction is the, our current body of knowledge related to that question so what do people currently think in terms of what people would say the answer is what do we know about that question in general and it doesn't have to be everything we know, but it needs to be enough to give some context to your current study. Okay, and again, I'll talk more about that when I talk about the introduction. Uh, the other big piece of instruction, other than your research question, along with its importance in the current knowledge, uh, is your hypothesis. So, what do you think the answer is to that question? 
And the important thing here is to make sure you build a, a robust rationale for your hypothesis. Not just, well, I think that's how it could be. Seems right. Not good enough. You have to have uh, reasons you know, based on uh, previous research and slight to uh, looking at slightly similar questions, not maybe the exact same question. Because if the exact question has already been answered, why are you doing it again? But maybe um, you know there's some therapy that you're, you're suggesting might be effective with kids, and it's only been shown to be effective with adults. You might say, okay, well, it's been shown to be effective with adults, and um, the the ways in which kids and adults are different shouldn't impact the difference in efficacy, because maybe it doesn't require a lot of cognitive ability or whatever. You know, thinking about how kids and adults uh, are different. We have to provide a rationale for your hypothesis, uh, and that's your introduction. Right? Uh, and then the method section, uh, usually not always, but in this class you will have uh, a design subsection where you briefly describe <coughs> the uh, the design of your method. You know, experimental, non-experimental, uh, you know, correlational, um, um, you know, uh, a factor, not a factor, but uh, a simple experiment. Um, You'll uh, talk about what your variables are, and you'll give operational def definitions of them. And again, more details on that later. Uh, you'll talk about the sample, so who's in the study, um, some, or who, not who is in the study, who you want to be in the study. Uh, and if you're going to um, try to recruit um, a certain number of people uh, according to certain categories, and the big categories I always think of are uh, gender, ethnicity, and age. So you can talk about that. You know, what incentive are they going to get? Um, how are you going to get these people? That kind of stuff goes in, sa in the sample subsection. Uh, materials, which could be experimental materials. Like if you're showing people pictures, you would describe those. If you're having people you know, solve uh, puzzles, you would describe those. But it's also what goes here are your measures. So sometimes it's called, uh, if you don't have any manipulative materials, it's just called the measures section. Uh, materials is fine too, uh, or you describe the questionnaires and the surveys or the tests that you're having people complete and talk about those psychometric like properties and how many questions there are and all that uh, that stuff. And then the, the usually the big section of the method is the procedure. So what will people do when participants first arrive at the experiment or when I first arrive, you know, in the uh, in the field where I will observe people, whatever. What's going to happen from beginning to end, and how long it's going to take, with enough detail that somebody can go back and do it again. Right? Uh, and a proposal with enough detail, that people say, "Yeah, I think you're doing the right thing, and it makes sense that you're doing that." So the other thing you want to kind of weave throughout the method section in a proposal is why you're making some decisions. Like, well, I'm, I'm going to get people this way because it'll be a representative sample of this population who I'm really interested in. Or I'm uh, making sure to counterbalance the presentation of these stimuli to avoid uh, a confound of order effects, which we'll talk later about what order effects are. But you want to talk about why you're making some of your decisions uh, as well. Uh, and then instead of a results section, typically you have more of a data analysis section. Here you'll talk about you know what scores or data will be used, will be analyzed. You know, So um, we'll evaluate um, people's uh, average scores on the BDI2 or whatever it is. Uh, and then what tests you're going to use for analysis. You know, uh, an uh, analysis of variance will be used to blah, blah, blah. Uh, a Pearson correlation coefficient will be calculated to determine the relationship between blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, you say what test you would use and what you're going to use it for. Not just an ANOVA will be used to analyze the results. No, that's too vague. ANOVA will be used to what? Examine differences between this and this, right? Uh, and the other thing that people sometimes forget to put is the expected pattern of results. So, uh, uh, Pearson correlation, cor correlation coefficient will be calculated to determine the relation between A and B. It is expected that this will be a, uh, a positive, moderately sized correlation. Right? So, what do you think? Is, which goes back to your hypothesis, but stating it in terms of uh, uh, scores on the tests that you're talking about. That's what the results section, the data analysis section is all about. The discussion section then uh, has some overlap. You can restate the expected outcome, which is your hypothesis, right? But not in terms of scores. So in the data analysis sec section, you may say it's expected that uh, individuals who score, um, you know, who receive higher scores on a BDI2, a depression inventory, um, will. Um, uh, report uh, having uh, missed more days of work during the two-month period of observation. 
Right. So you're saying at a very kind of numbers level what you're expecting. The discussion, you'll say, you know, it's expected that uh, people who report being more depressed miss more days of work. So you'll speak, you'll talk more at the the uh, the concept level and less at the the number level in the discussion section. Uh, once you do that, it doesn't take long, you address um, what would limit the conclusions that could be drawn. So if I went out and conducted the study and I got some results back, I'm gonna make I'm gonna draw some conclusions, right? And either the results will be consistent with my expectation, expectations, my hypothesis is supported. So if that were true, so if, I, if I'm looking at uh, kind of an experiment, I say, okay, uh, there is an effect of A on B. I could be wrong because blah, blah. It has to do with you know how you collect the data, uh, who you got in your sample, uh, how you measure the variables, whatever. you got to identify those things that would uh, impact your um, internal validity, maybe. Or you can also think about external validity. So I said there's an effect, but my sample was only, uh, you know, left-handed cello players, so it may not generalize to other people. Right? So you, you address that. But you also can uh, here write about if uh, you don't find what you think you're going to find. So uh, I may find that there's no effect, but that could happen because why? Maybe the the you know study was insufficiently powered because you didn't have enough people in the sample, or Whatever, that's what you have to uh, think about. That's where your your own creativity and, and, and thinking comes in. Uh, and after you address these potential limitations, you address uh, potential implications of results. So if once we get an answer to this question, it will influence what people do about this. So if I find there is an effect, people should do this. However, if I find there's not an effect, then people should do this. Right? And it could be applied implications. It could also be kind of basic science implications. So if I find there's an effect in this, then that means that the next question is this. Or uh, then there's more support for this theory than this theory. Right? All things that you could potentially address in the uh, discussion section. Um, okay, so that's a, a brief, rather quick overview. And again, I'll address uh, each of these uh, sections in separate videos um, as we're getting closer to, to working on them throughout the semester. That's all for now. Take care.